what free is? What's free? Free is when nobody else can tell us what to be. Free is when the TV ain't controlling what we see. Told my nigga I need you. Through all the fame, you know I stay true. Pray my nigga stay free. Made a few mistakes, but this ain't where I want to be. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Hog Line Podcast. As always, I am your host, Mitchell Manis. You are listening to episode 21 of the Hog Line Podcast. Uh, it is just me today, uh, live in studio here. It's December 6th. It's a little cold. I'm recording from my basement, so grabbed a blanket. And I am uh, bundled up. I'm ready to talk some sports with all of you. Well, I'm not really talking. I'm talking to an audience, not really, but I'm talking to myself. I, I'm the only one here. That's what I'm trying to say. This is a solo episode, um, so I'll keep it a little short, but I have a lot of topics to get into today. Uh, my first topic, first and foremost, is I'm going to get you caught up on some college basketball. We are about uh, three or four weeks into the college basketball season. A lot has happened, and I haven't really talked about it that much since it, uh, since the preview episode with Kieran. I don't even know if I talked about it at all, but uh, I'm going to be getting caught up on that. And I'm going to be talking some NBA. I haven't talked some NBA in a while, but we're going to get caught up on that as well. Uh, we're about a quarter of the way through the season. Uh, teams have probably played around 20, 25 games, so a lot to talk about there. And to close out the show, I'm going to be previewing Week 14 in the NFL season. Uh, fantasy playoffs, probably for most of you, most exciting time of the year, in my opinion. Uh, you know, gotta gotta get gear up for the playoffs. I hope you all made your made the playoffs. And if you didn't, well, you should have listened to more of the Hogline podcast, probably. Uh, <laughs> anyway. So, yeah, that's the itinerary for today's episode, and uh, I'm going to get into it. So, let me digress a little bit to college basketball. I mean, I, I just love college basketball. It is probably my second favorite league of the, you know, professional or college leagues, probably my second favorite. Uh, I love when March rolls around, as uh, if any of you know me, you know I love March Madness. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I, I just can't wait for that. A lot to look forward to, you know, February Super Bowl and... You know, I mean, there's good sports all. I'm getting on a tangent here. Anyway, <laughs> um, college basketball, you know, lots have happened. Uh, the top 10, top 25 has been, you know, shaken up a little bit since the start of the year. And I'm just going to run down the top 10 as it is. Uh, I think we're the fourth weekend, as I said earlier. But number one is Gonzaga. Number two is Kansas. Number three is Duke. Number four is UVA. Number five, Michigan. Number six, Nevada. Number seven, Tennessee. Number eight, Auburn. Nine, Kentucky. And ten, Michigan State. So that is the top ten as it stands right now. And uh, I just want to talk about a few of these teams, break uh, some of them down. And uh, I guess we, if you're talking about college basketball, you got to start with Duke. You know, everyone is you know, just fascinated by them, and myself included. Uh, I mean, how can you not be with the top three recruits in a class going to the same school? That's doesn't happen like ever. I don't know if it ever has, but you know this is a, an excuse me an historic freshman class for Duke, and I mean they're playing like it honestly. Uh, I think they they only lost that one game I believe to Gonzaga, who was the number one team, who I'll be talking about in a second here. But you know I mean they're just so fun to they're must watch television. They really are. Uh, you can't. I don't know. You you can't not turn them on. Like there's you don't know what they're gonna do. You don't know what kind of crazy dunk. Zion's going to do, or one night Cam Reddish will be hitting like seven threes, and and, and then they got R.J. Barrett, who's probably the maybe the best out of the three all around, skill-wise, but um, you know, it's just they're must-watch television, and uh, they're exciting, but in the same breath as I say that, and how much you know everyone likes to talk about Duke, and how infatuated everybody is with them, I don't know. I don't, I'm not, I, I kind of have like a feeling about these things. I start to think about in November and December who I'm going to be picking three months from now in March to win it all. And I don't really know if I feel about this Duke team. I know that they're like super, super talented and all of that, but there's something about it doesn't feel right. I feel like, I mean, people felt this way about the Kentucky team with Car Anthony Towns that went undefeated in the regular season. They didn't win it all. They lost to Wisconsin in the final four. So I don't know. I don't really have the, this feeling about a Duke team, this Duke team. 
and I, I don't know why because they're probably one of the most talented teams ever uh, that Duke has produced, which is saying a lot considering how much talent they get to go there. But I don't know. I don't know if it's just because I'm just slightly fatigued about everyone talking about it or I because I picked Duke last year and they didn't win at all, and I'm, I'm like subconsciously salty about that. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. I, I, I would bet that they wouldn't win at all, which is... I, don't know, I would take the field if I was had to choose between Duke or everyone else. I, I just I, part, maybe partially because I'm because I'm just about to talk about some other teams that I think are really talented. So I I think there's a lot of good teams, and um, I don't know. I I think it's more wide open than people think it is. I think to the casual observer, they just look at oh you know Duke has all these guys and you know they put up a lot of points and they've got Zion. It's just easy to get caught up in that. So to the casual fan, to the casual observer, it's easy to just say, oh, Duke's going to win it all. Do we really have to watch this? But I think we do because I just think there's a lot of good teams here. And to move on to one of those good teams is Gonzaga, the number one team, the team that gave Duke its only loss this season. And Gonzaga is, you know, very classy college basketball program. Uh, they do well every year they I, they're in the western I, I forget their conference name it's like the wcc i believe it is and they always win it i they i don't know how many years in a row they've won it but it must be as long as i've been alive probably and you know they're always in the tournament and despite not playing the best competition in the regular season they bring it in in march and you know they haven't really had they haven't really won it all and put it all together but they've had some good teams over the years and they I mean they made the finals 2 years ago and they did pretty well last year but you know just just a great great basketball school and i love that atmosphere there and they're playing like it they're the number one team in the country right now uh and I, if you know anything about Gonzaga basketball it starts with Rory Archimora uh, you know, he's their six eight wing player, um, and he's really developed into a nice to the superstar, quite frankly. I mean, on that team that made the national championship, I don't I think he's a junior. If I'm not mistaken, he's a junior. I believe he was on that national championship team two years ago. And you know, last year and the year before that, he was just kind of a role player and he's really taken that next step this year. I mean, you see his numbers improve he, this year he's averaging 22 and 6 a game and um he's freakishly athletic, great defender. Um and he's um you can really you, if you look at the progression of NBA mock drafts over the last month or two, you really see his name start to shoot shoot up the draft boards, you know, in the beginning of the year I don't even know if he was projected to go in the first round or not, but now you see his name in the middle of the first round and maybe even higher in some. So I mean, he's super athletic. Um, he can jump out of the gym. He's six eight, seven two wingspan. All these guys have humongous wingspans, but you know, Rory is, you know, he's really fun to watch, and he's developed into a great scorer and a great defender. So, I mean, he's a leader of that squad, and they've got a couple other good pieces around him. And one of the best coaches, I believe, his name is Mark Few, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I didn't look that up, but I'm not 100 percent sure. But he always seems to have his guys ready to play and prepared come uh you know february march when it really counts so i mean watch out for gonzaga they should be one or two seed in uh march madness uh another team i wanted to touch on oh wait hold on sorry last thing about gonzaga is they play north carolina on december 15th which is about a week from now i believe it is next saturday uh so that'll be fun to watch they had those two schools haven't played since uh, the national championship in tw- uh, two years ago when North Carolina defeated them. So, I mean, that'll be fun to watch. North Carolina uh, has dipped a little bit in the rankings, but still uh, a great team led by Luke May and Nasir Little. So, I mean, that, that'll be fun to watch that championship rematch in uh, in about a week. Uh, another team that I wanted to touch on is a team that I picked to go to the finals last year, and it turned out to be correct, and it's Michigan. Uh, this is the first year that they've really like, I mean, I know it's early. It's only a month into the college basketball season, but Michigan has never really been at the top of the rankings. They're all, they always, they're a solid team. They always make the tournament and I like them so much because they always, they, they play up to the competition in March and they always seem to make a run. 
So I really felt that with the team last year. But this year, I mean, they return a lot of the pieces from last year's team. Very all-around great team. You know, they got Matthews, who's probably their best scorer. Uh, Jordan Pohl, Pohl, I said Pohl, Jordan Poole, excuse me, uh, the guy who hit the game-winning buzzer-beater shot against Houston last year in the tournament. He has really stepped up uh, in his sophomore season so far. You see him getting more shots. And uh, they have that one guy who's a tall white guy. I forget his name. He's like foreign, so it's kind of hard to pronounce. But uh, he's great on the boards. I was watching them against Nova especially. He was great on the boards. And, uh, you know, Isaiah Livers, good off the bench there. So they've got a really good all-around team. They really know how to play together and uh, play great offense, play great defense. And, again, one of the best coaches in the country in John Beeline uh, when you have a great coach in college basketball, I think that really makes a difference. Um, guys that have been there and, you know, will give you that that edge over a team that might not have a coach that is as experienced or it's not as good as them. So Michigan's number five. They're playing great, probably playing better than people expected them to this year. And I like to see it. I, I mean, as a Rutgers fan, uh, they're in our conference and all, and there are quote-unquote rivals in football not really but they beat us every time but I like to see that because I mean I always seem to pick them and for some reason they have a they have a little soft spot in my heart Michigan so good for the Wolverines and we'll see how they how their play continues across the season uh one other main team I want to talk about here that's not in the top 10 is Villanova I mean obviously we all know what they did last year national champions uh, but they lose four guys from four of their main players, DiVincenzo, Jalen Brunson, uh, Mario Spellman, and Mikhail Bridges to the NBA. And, I mean, obviously that's just going gonna, just gonna to take a big toll on your team when you lose your four best players. And uh, they haven't really lived up to their preseason hype, but they're still not, like, you know, doing that bad. I believe they're 7-2 and two right now in the time that I'm recording this. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm confident they'll put it together. I mean, Jay Wright's a great coach, and um, they're still figuring some things out. Uh, they've got a freshman, Javon Quinterly. Uh, he's still kind of not really getting as many minutes as I thought he would, and uh, he's still trying to find his role on the team. But, I mean, it all comes with experience, as we all know. And uh, Archbishop Wood's own Colin Gillespie is getting more minutes. I believe he averages 10 a game, so, you know, he, I'd like to see that. Uh, he's getting more more minutes, more shots, more playing time. And, uh, you know, it's just all of a, oh, you know, adjustment period. Uh, seeing these guys that were role players like Cosby, Roundtree, and Gillespie last year. And, I mean, they got to play more minutes this year. So I'm confident they'll put it together. Still a very talented team. I didn't even mention their two best players in Booth and Pascal. But uh, I don't know. Nova's still making the tournament. If anyone, like, they're, they're definitely will. They'll definitely be a top. I'd be shocked if they were below six or seven. Uh, so, I mean, look out for them. Definitely don't count them out yet, even though they haven't necessarily gotten off to the start that they might not want to. They're, I'm saying that like they're like 500. They're still seven and two. Like they're not. They're not bad at all. So, uh, look out for Nova. There was a brief time that they were unranked, which is so weird to see how the national champion goes to unranked in the first two weeks of the season. But uh, they're back in the top 25, and they should be ready to go. Uh, last few words on college basketball. I wanted to mention some teams that, uh, are kind of underground teams, kind of sleeper teams, maybe teams to watch out for when, a, uh, maybe you want to pick them to win a few games in March. I know it's kind of early, but never too early to get these teams on our radar. The first team I have is, uh, St. John's uh, coming out of the big East. Uh, Joe Lenardi came out with his first preseason bracketology a few days ago. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, you should check that out. And he had St. John's as a 10 seed, which is, um, you know, pretty good. They've got, they've got their best player. Their team runs through Shimori Pons, who, if you also look at mock drafts, he, you see his name starting to pop up because he's just unbelievable. I said him on the college basketball preview show, so. I wouldn't say I called it because he's had two amazing years before this, but uh, Shamori Pons is really killing it for St. John's, and uh, maybe look out, maybe look for them to see if that guy. You know, college basketball is a team sport and doesn't all re- rely on one guy. But uh, let's see how, let's see what uh, Pons can do. Let's see if he can carry them. 
I'm sure he'll lead them to a good record this year. So we'll see what they do. Another team I have is uh, South Dakota State Jackrabbits. They are in uh, the Summit League, and they will almost certainly win that as they're probably the most talented team in that league, and they will only get that one team in the tournament. It probably will be the Jackrabbits. I hope they're I hope their mascots are Jackrabbits. I hope I'm not. I didn't mess that up. That would be so weird. <laughs> I'm just calling them the Jackrabbits. But uh, they're led by Mike Dom. I remember him in the tournament last year. He had a really good game. I believe they got bounced by Ohio State, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but Mike Dom averaging 23 and a half points and 10 and a half boards this season in the first uh, 10 games that they've played. And he's uh, he's a big man. He's about 6'9", 6'10", big body, and uh, really knows how to finish around the rim. So, uh, I mean, these are two players and two teams to maybe, you know, keep on your radar as a couple of teams, you know, because there's always going to be upsets in, in the tournament. So keep an eye on uh, those two teams and the teams I just mentioned. So, I mean, I, I just can't wait for March. Uh it can't come soon enough. I mean, I don't want to fast forward through all that fo- uh, the football because that's the main thing I like. But, you know, March is a very exciting time of the year, and um, I'm looking forward to when it comes. So, yeah, that's going to conclude uh, college basketball for me. I'm going to move on to the NBA. I'm going to talk about some of the recent games that happened over the last day or two, and then I'm going to focus on the big picture and see, you know, how things are progressing as – we are about a quarter of way, quarter of the way through the season. Uh, some games that happened yesterday. Uh, I turned on the Nets and the Thunder game yesterday in the fourth quarter, in the beginning of the fourth quarter, and the Nets were up by 20 points going into the fourth quarter, which was shocking in itself. But Oklahoma City came back and won in regulation behind Paul George's 25 points in the fourth quarter. That is, and what what also jumps out at you is that the Nets scored 19 points in the fourth quarter, and Paul George alone scored 25. So Paul George outscores the Nets the fourth quarter by six points all by himself. Uh, that goes, uh, tops on his 47 in the game. So Paul George really balled out. Uh, Russell Westbrook also had a triple-double in the game. Uh, I believe that moves him to third on the all-time list in triple-doubles. So... I mean, I mean, what a great performance! I I'm so happy I turned on this game. It was just I just stumbled upon it. And I'm like, wow, this is a great game to watch. Paul George was on fire from three, and I mean, I, the Thunder is playing great. They're second in the West right now. Uh, I know the West is kind of tight, which I will get into in a second here. But second in the West as of now, and they're just playing great. And uh, I don't know. I expect Oklahoma City to make some noise in the postseason. I know it's going to be kind of hard in a stacked West, but I don't know. I'd look out for them. I I think that maybe this year they will take. I'm not. I'm not guaranteeing they're gonna make the finals or the Western Conference finals even. But I don't know. I'd keep them on the radar, and I don't know. They're just a complete team. And if Paul George can play like this on a consistent basis, I know he's not gonna put up 47 every night. But if you can get him to you know do his thing, and the Thunder are gonna do great. So. I was so happy I watched that game. Another game that uh, happened last night was the Lakers played the Spurs, and the Lakers won 121 to 113. And LeBron James scores 42 points in the game and 20 in the fourth quarter. So the King did his thing. Very similar game to Paul George, and uh, I don't know. He just took over in that fourth quarter, and it just proves that he's still as quick as he was 10 years ago. Maybe I mean he may be playing better basketball. And uh, I don't know. I mean, the Lakers start off the season a little shaky, but they're 15 and nine right now, and they're starting to put it together. And I'm gonna get into a second with my thoughts on the Lakers uh, from a season-long perspective. But good win for them last night. Uh, I know the Spurs aren't really necess- necessarily playing their best basketball right now, but I mean, good for them, good for Lakers, and good for LeBron. So yeah. If we look at the NBA, if you look at the standings as of right now, like I said, we're a quarter of the way through the season, about 23, 24 games in. And uh, I don't know, I looked at, I kind of looked this over and I I wrote down a few things that I, you know, see developing here. Uh, I would be, I don't know, I have to talk about the Celtics when I talk about the NBA, my Celtics. 
Um, they are sixth right now in the East. And uh, some would say we're not playing our best basketball right now, which is fine. Uh, but I'm, again, like as a theme with all these t- like, talented teams that are struggling in the beginning of the season, like you could say Nova is, like I said earlier. And uh, if you look at the Warriors, even though they're 17-9, and nine, not playing up to Warrior standards, and the Celtics, you know, these talented teams that struggle early on, and it's a theme. You don't worry about them because you're confident that they're going to put it together. And that is no different with the Celtics. Um, I'm not worried. Not worried at all. Uh, you know, you see Gordon Hayward, especially, like, especially in the first... 15, I'd say, games. He's starting to play a little bit better as of late, but it was not pretty in the first 10, 15 games. But that's that's expected. When you're coming off of that, what he, all everything he's been through, not playing basketball for an entire year, and just getting your mind right, just getting your shots up, it's one thing to do it when you're uh, playing and practice against your teammates, but it's a whole other thing to put it together during an actual game. So that 15... 10, 15 games where he was really not that good at all. And I think he even came off the bench in a few games, which is really, really weird to think about, a former All-Pro coming off the bench like that. But um, I don't know. I'm not worried at all. I'm confident the Celtics will put it together. And we may not be like a top one or two seed. Like, like I, I said, there's no way we're not the one in the, in the year. But, I mean, I know the Raptors and the Bucks look really good right now. So, we may not finish the regular season as as strong as I anticipated, but Celtics are still coming out of the East. Don't you all worry about that, especially you Sixers fans. Don't don't think you're winning the East. It, it, that be it's foolish. It's foolish. Uh, <laughs> the West I also observed is super tight right now. For it, listen to this, this is crazy. Fourteen teams in the West are separated by six and a half games. That that is insane. I know it's only a, a, it's a twenty five game sample size, but still, like even the top six teams were separated by two and a half games. Like that is super competitive, and um, I don't know. That's what you exactly what you want to see. That's like what it was last year. I believe the third and the eighth seed were separated by a very small margin of games. So I mean that that just proves how you know competitive it could be. Um. I don't know. That just really jumped out at me. You see the teams that are struggling early on, excuse me, like the Rockets. And, uh, you know, I, like I said, same same narrative. I'm not worried about these teams because over an 82-game regular season, the cream will rise. I don't know that exactly. I don't know what I'm saying. But the talent, the talented teams will, you know, it'll even out is what I'm trying to say. The Rockets will move up and... You know, the Lakers are five. They'll probably stay around there. But the Warriors, I'd be surprised if they finished fourth or fifth in the West. Like, the Nuggets are not going to be the one seed. Like, the Warriors will do their thing. We just got to be patient. And that's what happens in the beginning of seasons like this. People overreact, and you just get, that's why they play 82 games and not 20, 23 games. Uh, and one final word I want to say is I am going to stick with my initial prediction which I gave on the NBA preview show, that it will be the Los Angeles Lakers and the Golden State Warriors in the Western Conference Finals. And I can't really give you a straight answer why, but, I mean, the the Warriors is a no-brainer why, but for the Lakers, uh, I know they're not as talented as some of these some of these other teams, like the Thunder, and, uh, I mean, even the Rockets, you know, even though they're struggling now, they're still a talented team. But it's just LeBron and... I, I hate to say it because I'm still not the biggest LeBron fan, but he just seems like he's going to take this team to the Western Conference Finals. They're not making the finals, but I don't know. I can just totally see this happening in my mind, and I hope I'm right because that would be cool if I called it from the beginning. I know it's not really a bold prediction to say, but I'm still sticking with the Lakers and the Warriors in the Western Conference Finals. So... That is the NBA for now. We will dive into that later on. Um, come Christmas time, I'm going to have Jack and my editor, Joey Bolton, on the show. And we'll be reca- recapping the Christmas Day game. So that will probably happen shortly after Christmas. And we'll probably dive back into the NBA around then. So stay tuned for that. That's sure to be a good episode. Um, yeah. So the last thing I want to talk about is week 14 in the NFL season. 
Uh, I'm going to preview that a little bit. I'm going to, at the end, I'm going to tell you some of the matchups I like, some of the matchups I don't like for some players in your fantasy teams. And, uh, yeah. So, big week, home stretch of the NFL season, four games to go for all teams. And this is just, this is so exciting. This is what we live for. Um, teams will either fall apart or they'll rise. And um, I just can't wait to see how it all unfolds. So some of the matchups that are, you know, some of the best ones this week. We've got Philly going to Dallas. Uh, huge game for the NFC East. I, as you all know, if you, I mean, I bet the majority of people listening to this are probably Eagles fans and you know how important this game is. The Eagles come in at six and six, and the Cowboys are seven and five. And I mean, the winner of this game uh, can probably controls their own destiny. And if the Cowboys win, the Eagles probably a long shot to make the playoffs. And if the Eagles win, they're right in the thick of things. And uh, I believe they'd control their own destiny. They'd be tied with Dallas, and they'd have they'd split head to head. I don't know how that would exactly work, but Eagles are certainly alive and it pains me to say it but they are alive and it also pains me to say this but I really think the Eagles are gonna win this game I don't know why I just I don't I don't trust the Cowboys yet I don't I know they're playing great I know they're coming off a victory against the Saints their defense played the lights out Zeke did his thing but for some reason I just can't get by the fact that the Eagles are gonna win this game I don't know what it is. I know their secondary is really hurt right now. But they're coming off two good games. Wentz is playing well. Josh Adams of uh, CB South. He's running the rock. He's doing his thing. He's doing great. And I don't know. I just I have a feeling the Eagles are going to sneak in the playoffs. I think the Eagles can go 9-7 and seven and make the playoffs. That's what I think is going to happen. So it's going to be interesting to see if... Dallas's linebackers can neutralize Josh and how Wentz is going to play and how Dak will, you know, he's not playing, he's not messing it up right now. I wouldn't say he's playing amazing, but he's not messing it up right now. Um, so I, I can't wait to watch this one. And I hope the Cowboys win. I don't think they will. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, another one I've written down uh, matchup wise is the Sunday night game. It got flexed the Sunday night. It is the Los Angeles Rams taking on the Chicago Bears. Uh, I believe Mitch Trubisky is going to play. I could be mistaken, and we're still a few days away, but something to monitor, I'm pretty sure. I think he's trending towards playing, if I'm not mistaken. So I mean, hope, I hope he is. No disrespect to Chase Daniel, but we want to see Trubisky out there. We want to see these teams at full strength. Uh, yeah, I mean, this should be a good one. It's in Chicago, so, I mean, that may help the Bears. Um, I see the Rams taking this. Uh, I mean, Gurley, I'm, I wouldn't be scared of him at all even though he's going against probably the best defense in the league but I think Gurley's gonna probably score two touchdowns like he always does so uh should be a good one and we'll see how the Rams how they play when they go to Chicago Chicago you know they're not used to that temperature it's gonna be probably cold and we'll see how it goes I hope Greg Zerline kicks a lot of field goals for sure because I have him on my fantasy team and I need to win so Greg better kick some 50 yarders buddy um, we'll see how that goes. I think the Rams are going to win that one. And another matchup I have is the Monday night game between the Vikings and the Seahawks. The Vikings come in at 6-5-1, and one, and the Seahawks are 7-5. and five. Uh, Huge matchup in the NFC wildcard race. I believe if, this, if it ended today, the Seahawks would be the 5, and the Vikings would be the 6 seed. So, I mean, this is huge for both teams. Seahawks come in, they're really hot. I don't know how many, I don't know what they've done exactly in their last five, six games, but I'm sure they've won almost all of them. Uh, they're playing really well. Defense looks pretty good. People were kind of trashing them in the beginning of the year, saying they weren't the same as they were. But defense is playing really well as of late. And Russell Wilson, if you have Russell Wilson, you have a hope every week. So, uh, I mean, I think this is going to be a great game. Probably going to decide a lot of fantasy matchups for the playoffs. Certainly will for mine. Um, so, I, I mean, great game. And I expect it to be close. I don't know who... I think I'll have the Seahawks taking this one, if I'm actually making a prediction here. I think the Seahawks will take this one. Uh, they got the home crowd behind them. And, yeah, I don't know. 
I, I, the Vikings were I picked to win the Super Bowl in the beginning of the year, and I still think they can, they still could do it. Seems like a long shot as of now, but I mean, I'm still waiting for them to get hot, and I think it is coming soon. So, yeah, if Dalvin Cook, Dalvin Cook's got to get going, and he's played better as the past uh, over the past two weeks. Still, I mean, they're kind of like limiting his carries. Like he's doing really well uh, from a, from an efficiency standpoint. But they're kind of limiting him, which I guess kind of makes sense because I'd be kind of scared to give Dalvin the full work ro- uh, workload if I were the Vikings because he just hasn't been able to stay healthy, unfortunately. So if limiting his touches and easing him back into action very slowly is the answer to preserve his long-term health and value to the team, that's what you got to do. So um, we'll see how that goes. He could be a difference maker in their season. So, yeah, that's all for the matchups this week. One other thing I wanted to say is um, look out for the Bills. I don't know why. I have a, I have a strong feeling that this team is going to finish the year strong. And I, if you're a Bills fan, I don't even know if you want that because you can't really make the playoffs at this point and you might want a better draft pick. But I really think the Bills could finish the year strong if they put their minds to it. Um, Josh Allen, I, I he is – quite frankly impressed me. I was not a big fan of his going into the season and that whole drop the excuse me the whole draft process. I wasn't a big fan of his uh but he is a tough kid. He can run the ball. He had like 100 and like 35 rushing yards last week and he did that a few times where he's had a high rushing total. So tough kid, huge arm obviously as you all know, he can throw it a mile. Um and I don't know. I think he's got that it factor. I mean, he has, out of the rookie quarterbacks, he's probably played, I don't know, I'd say the second or third best out of the top five that were taken in the first round. Um, it's kind of tough because the, the Bills really have no no skill with players at all for him to get the ball to. Besides an aging LaShawn McCoy, like, really, there's nothing. Maybe. They did recently, they cut Kelvin Benjamin, which is probably addition by subtraction, in my opinion. Uh, he, I don't know if anyone heard. It was a few weeks ago, but Josh Allen asked Kelvin Benjamin to if he wanted to run routes pre-game, pre-game and Kelvin said no. Like, like I don't know. Kelvin Benjamin surprises me every day, in my opinion. I'm not a big fan, but that is just weird. So, I don't know. I am quite impressed with Josh Allen. And if the Bills can add some skill position skill position players around him in the next few years and, you know, keep some of the pieces on defense like they have, uh, I don't know. I think the Bills could be doing this, I guess, kind of rebuild that they're in. They could do it right. So, I don't know. Look out for the Bills. I think they're going to finish the year strong. Some of – oh, yeah, I'm going to move on. Some of the matchups that I like in fantasy this week, if you're looking for some advice – I'm not going to give you a full stardom sit em like I did in previous episodes, but some of the matchups I like uh, are Philip Lindsay versus the 49ers. Philip Lindsay has been killing it this year. If you were able to scoop him up on waivers early in the season, uh, he's probably going to – he could win you your league, to be honest, because he had a great week last week, and I think he's going to maybe even do better this week. He plays the 49ers. Terrible defense. He's at home, and, uh, I mean – Still a decent price on DraftKings. I don't remember exact his exact price, but I believe he's still under like 5500 which is, if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong with that, but still unbelievable to me. I think he should be more salary-wise on DFS sites, but I don't know. That guy's great. He averages 6.1 yards per carry, which is leads the NFL by a wide margin. So, Philip Lindsay, great runner. Really like him this week, too. Another guy I have written down is Mark Ingram at Tampa Bay. Uh, he's kind of been disappointing the past few weeks, as the whole Saints offense kind of has. But uh, I don't know. I think they're going to re- rebound this week because the Bucks they don't scare me at all in defense. And I don't know. I think they'll be playing with a lead, which helps Mark Ingram because, you know, if they want to dictate the pace of the game and control the clock, they can just hand it off to Ingram, who's their the bruiser. He can run out the clock very well. So I look for Ingram to probably have, you know, 80, 90 yards, hopefully get in the end zone. So I like Mark Ingram this week. 
Another guy that I like, which is, I mean, obviously he's a must start because you're never going to bench this guy. But if you're looking to maybe have a contrarian play in uh, DraftKings or FanDuel or whatever you play on, you might want to go Tyree Kill because, I mean, he plays the Ravens, who are they have the best pass defense in the NFL, I believe. And people are probably going to be looking at that and be scared. They don't really want to pay up for him. So, But if he catches a long touchdown, which he could do any play he steps on the field, he's going to be worth that price because I don't think his uh, percentage owned is going to be that high because he has a tough matchup and he kind of dropped a dud last week. So I think, yeah, I think you might want to go Tyreek Hill potentially in your lineups in DFS this week. So look out for that. And the one last guy I like is Jimmy Graham versus the Atlanta, uh, I almost said the Atlanta Seahawks. That was weird. Atlanta Falcons. It, yeah, I like Jimmy Graham because uh, I think the Packers offense is going to be, uh, you know, kind of kind of be re- revitalized. Um, and I mean, they fired Mike McCarthy, McCarthy, Mike McCarthy. I can't speak today. They fired Mike McCarthy earlier this week. I'm sure you all know. And I think that's going to, you know, give them a boost in a way, their offense. And uh, Jimmy Graham, he's fighting through a thumb injury, but he saw 11 targets last week, caught eight of them, didn't get in the end zone, so it didn't really look like the best stat line. But I don't know. I think he's going to see a lot of targets his way. And I don't know. I kind of have a feeling about Jimmy Graham this week. Some of the guys I dislike, I just have a few written down. Spencer Ware, kind of disappointed last week. I know everyone expected him to take that next step as he took over Kareem Hunt as the starter. And he was kind of disappointing from an efficiency standpoint. I think he averaged like under four a carry, which is not, you know, leaves much to be desired. And uh, he plays Baltimore this week. Again, tough matchup. So we'll see how that goes. And another guy I have written down is Jeff Wilson. He's the guy who took over for Matt Breida last week. Uh, I believe he had like 130 all-purpose yards. And I don't know. I'm not really buying it. Just because the guy's a starter doesn't necessarily mean he's going to do well with the touches he receives. Receives. Uh, and I don't know. I'm not really buying into this guy. I, maybe it's because I didn't really necessarily watch him play, but I don't know. I could be wrong. He's at Denver this week, and uh, they got good linebackers. Potentially, you could stop the run. Uh, I don't know. I'm not really buying into Jeff Wilson this week, so... I'd start him with caution if I were you. If you have better options, I'd go with that. And one last guy I have is Jarvis Landry versus the Panthers. Uh, he has really not been good at all since Hugh Jackson got fired. And he stopped calling the plays. And last week he had a decent week. He had six catches for 103 yards. So 16 in PPR and 10 in standard. Uh, I don't know. I wouldn't fall under the trap that that's going to be this week. I, he's, I just can't trust him. He's not a consistent producer at this point, and I don't know. I don't have a good feeling, so just don't. You can't base off the guys like just solely off of week to week, and like just because he had a good week last week doesn't necessarily mean it's going to continue this week. So, just because of his inconsistency, and I don't really know his role in this offense quite yet, I'd uh, I'd stay away from Jarvis this week. He plays the Carolina Panthers at home. So. That is the episode. I hopped around, had a lot of different things to talk about, and thank you for listening, as always. Um, Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Hogline Podcast. Follow the show on Instagram, because we post, try to post as much as we can on there, and you'll get all your updates through that. It's The Hogline Podcast, that is the Instagram name. And follow me on Instagram at Mitchell Manage if you want. Holding on your bitch could have never sold you a brick. Uh, anyway, thank With you very much. You never and been on the list. Weekend, Mona Lisa to me ain't nothing but a bill. Hanging pictures like swinging from his dick. We so different, you thought these didn't exist. The Megalodon never seen on his wrist. I'm from the south where they never make it this rich. God is the greatest, but Satan been on his shit. Walking the pavement, I pray I'm illuminated. Over a decade and never nobody's favorite Pot and kilo go hand in hand like we gamble and huff My amigo a million grams when we count them and up You was dead broke, I let you hold it back